Hello, um, so today I thought I would talk about burial practices um, in ancient China. Um, and burial practices are a particularly interesting topic to me um, because often, I mean, the conception of mortality and the conception of um, some kind of a life after death, it, it underpins a lot of uh, what civilization is and the way civilization operates. And so studying civilization, particularly through the lens of uh, burial practices and the way um, particular societies treat their dead, it's often quite an interesting way to, to learn more about society itself. Um, and particularly in China, there's an incredibly rich archaeological record of burial practices. Um, there are large tombs that are called Hangtu, and Hangtu have um, plastered walls, and they are also sealed with clay and charcoal, and so they preserve the objects inside very well. And then these objects inside them are also often non-perishable. So we have bronzes, ceramics, uh, lacquerware. Um, but in particular, what I particularly want to focus on in this short talk is uh, jade burial suits. Um, so if you were buried with a jade burial suit in ancient China, it meant that you were someone um, of note, someone of, of exceptional importance, because these jade, these jade suits, they took a, a huge amount of skill and a huge amount of time to craft. They're made from individual uh, jade slates, which are then threaded together often with gold or uh, silver thread. Of hundreds of these different slates will be used to create just one suit. Um, so an incredibly expensive and incredibly time-consuming task that would only be reserved for the, the very highest in society. And so one question you might be asking is uh, why jade rather than, than gold or, or silver, as we might expect, at least in the West, to a uh, to be given to people who are of exceptional importance. Um, and the main reason is there's a, a conception that jade has a, a dual property, one of allowing some part of your soul to um, remain safe within the tomb and safe from any dangerous external forces, while also allowing the second part of your soul to escape the tomb and to reach some kind of immort immortality. Um, so jade serves both of these functions, and that's why it's it's often used in in burial rites and often used as um, a tool that's often used as a material that um, can protect the wearer from harm in the real world as well. And as mentioned, these people who uh, wore jade suits, these were people of um, exceptional prestige within society. You weren't given a jade suit unless you were someone who was very important. So mainly the relatives of emperors and emperors themselves were almost always buried with jade suits. Um, and then on exceptional occasions, people who had performed a great deed in service of the emperor may also be bestowed a jade, a jade suit uh, upon their death. Because these people were very important, they're normally recorded in the written record. So China obviously has um, an incredibly long history of writing, an incredibly long history of uh, record keeping. Um, and one of the best examples of this is uh, Sima Qiang, he wrote the uh, Shuji, which is the um, records of a grand historian. Um, and this is essentially, it's, it's an almost exhaustive list of um, dynasties. And it lists people who were part of the imperial dynasty, uh, what they did, when they were born, when they died, and all kinds of useful information regarding them. So it's um, for historians and archaeologists alike, it's an exceptionally important resource to learn more about um, ancient China. So normally we have this incredibly rich archaeological record and we have this uh, very comprehensive written record um, of people who uh, lived and died in ancient China. And so these two coming together gives you a great deal of information about um, the people who, who lived during ancient China and what they did. However, in the last kind of 30 to 40 years, there have been a number of, um, if you want to say, chance excavations. Um, tombs have been uncovered in the process of quarrying or in the process of, of building um, as China's gone through this incredible economic growth. Um, and they've uncovered some tombs that have all the trappings of someone of note. They have high quality bronzes, high quality ceramics, um, lacquerware, um, and also often they have jade suits. Um, but the inscriptions that are attached to these tombs, the, when the, the inscriptions that say this person is buried here, the name that is listed is often, it often doesn't appear in the written record. So Sima Tien, his records of a, a grand historian, they won't record the person whose name is appearing in these uh, tombs that are being uncovered. 
And one particularly interesting example of this is the um, what archaeologists are calling the so-called King of Nanyue, who was uncovered in Guangzhou in uh, 1983 um, through, once again, a, um, a, a tip-off or a, a chance excavation. And as a, a very brief piece of background on uh, the Nanyue Kingdom. So the Nanyue Kingdom um, emerged after the fall of the Qin Dynasty. Um, so there is a, a warlord who's called um, Jiao Tuo. And Jiao Tuo is, um, he takes advantage of the, the chaos that ensues after the collapse of the Qin Dynasty to carve out his own personal kingdom that he calls the Nanyue. Um, and this kingdom, uh, it's located in modern times in, in kind of southern China and northern Vietnam. So it actually crosses the, bound, the modern day boundary between the two countries. So this kingdom, it exists and prospers for quite a long time. Um, and so after the Warring States period, so Liu Bang, who's the new emperor of the Han, the recently emerged Han dynasty, um, he sends an envoy to the kingdom of Nanyue and um, makes the king of Nanyue, so Jiao Tuo, he makes him into a vassal. Um, and from this point, he, he bestows the title of Wang upon him. Um, however, it's still quite an isolated kingdom, it doesn't have very much contact with the, the centralised Han bureaucracy. And so Jiao Tuo continues to stylize himself as an emperor within the Nanyue kingdom. And so now going back to this uh, king of Nanyue, who was discovered in Guangzhou in 1983, um, he is said to be, or well, the inscriptions around his jade suit state that he is Jiao Mo. However, a Jiao Mo never appears in the records of Sima Qian, um, in or in the, the records of a grand historian. And so up until now, he was a completely unknown figure. And so within Sima Qian's uh, records, there's, there's no space for a Jiao Mo. However, most modern his, his historians and most modern scholars believe that um, Jiao Mo, this Jiao Mo who was discovered, he is probably the son or the grandson of the original founder, Jiao Tuo, and was probably the father of the Jiao Hu, who comes later. Um, and so this seems very strange because we have an individual who clearly has all the trappings of being a person of considerable note. He has the right name, he's buried with a jade suit, he has elaborate uh, burial furnishings. Um, however, he doesn't appear in the dynastic record, even though his father or grandfather does, and also his son does. Um, and if we look a little bit closer at the jade suit of Jiao Mo, um, we can find a few interesting uh, tidbits of information. For example, it appears that the suit is made of slightly lower quality jade than other suits of its period. For example, it looks like the jade slates have been made from recycled jade objects. They're not all the same size, um, not all the same thickness, um, and generally the construction seems to be a little bit more uneven when compared to, to other jade suits. And so I've obviously given this title archaeological evidence versus written record. Um, and I think this particular case of um, Jiao Mo provides quite an interesting example of why we need to adopt an analogous approach to studying history using both archaeological evidence um, and written documentation. Uh, because if we were to base our studies purely on the written record, the tomb of Jiao Mo would never have been found. And so this missing piece uh, within Sima Qian's dynastic history, the missing piece between Jiao Tuo and um, Jiao Hu would never have been found and would never have been relocated. However, that said, without the written record, some of the intrigue um, regarding the burial and regarding the jade suit um, is lost because we begin to question why he was not included in the written record, why his suit seemed to be of lower quality. Potentially he made it himself, but why would someone of this importance have had to make his own jade suit? Potentially he had fallen out of favour, or potentially he just wasn't important enough to be included in Sima Tien's um, records of a grand historian. Um, we probably will never find the answers to these kind of questions, but um, it's, it's interesting food for thought to think about why someone who's clearly quite important was um, either not included or potentially um, erased from the official written history of China. And so bringing together an archaeological record and a written record in this way, the records of Grand Historian by Sima Tien and then the tomb of Jiao Mo, 
we can find some interesting insights not only into burial practices in ancient China, but also in the ways that the Han Dynasty and external kingdoms used to operate um, and how they used to interact with each other, mimic each other, um, and potentially, if, if Jiang Mo has been erased from history, um, how conflict was resolved between them. So, yeah, that's all for today. Thanks.